well, thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. Uh, for those who don't know me, and I'm hoping that a lot of you do by this point, uh, I'm the uh, president of the Ottawa Centre of the RESC. Uh, out of curiosity, how many uh, first-timers do we have here for the annual dinner meeting? Yeah, excellent. Okay, well, welcome, and uh, you're in for a treat. Uh, this uh, annual dinner meeting, which is held each November, is one of the most in anticipated events of the year, uh, right up there with Astronomy Day. And uh, we've been holding our dinner here at Algonquin uh, for many years now. We've been enjoying it every time, and you'll soon see why. It's a terrific opportunity to enjoy some fabulous food, courtesy of our hosts, to engage in stimulating conversation with our fellow members and their guests, and to have the chance to win some excellent door prizes later in the evening. So please keep your ticket stubs. Of course, uh, a major attraction of the evening is always our guest speaker. Tonight we are privileged to have with us Dr. Luc Simao uh, with the National Research Council of Canada's Hertzberg Institute for Astrophysics in Victoria, British Columbia, my, my native province, <laughs> who will later give his talk entitled Galaxies Like Grains of Sand. To use a quip from popular culture, our Milky Way galaxy is one of billions and billions that make up our universe. And while it is true that the well-known astronomer Carl Sagan never actually used this term in his television series Cosmos, Although, to put it on the record, he later did uh, it, use, uh, use it for one of his book titles. It is nonetheless staggering how many galaxies there are and how much we are still learning about them. We look forward to hearing a bit more about the latest research in this area from Dr. Samar. So, thank you again for joining us this evening. And uh, just uh, for it here, just a brief mention of uh, the year that's, that's come and almost gone. <laughs> still time, yes. It's still pretty bright out there, isn't it? So, uh, while we're here near the end of yet another year for the, the RAC Ottawa Centre, it has been my privilege to have served the Centre Council in a number of roles for the past few years, including President in 2009 and 2010. 2009, as we'll all remember, is a particularly important year for us, being the International Year of Astronomy, or IYA for short. While things have become uh, a bit less hectic uh, for us this year, we have nonetheless continued our efforts in promoting astronomy among the general public with uh, the star parties in CARP, as well as uh, our participation in last month's uh, Science Fun Fest at National Research Natural Resources Canada. We have also continued to be engaged with the National RESC organization as they seek ways to continue the momentum generated by IYA. Now, uh, those who who know me will know that in addition to RAC, these past two years have been fairly important ones in my own life. Uh, in 2009, my wife and I got married. And this year, in 2010... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> made contact. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, so this year, we welcomed a new arrival. And, and uh, as, as many of you sure know, a family, ex family expansion uh, can make for busier times. So I'd like to take this opportunity to extend a, a special thank you to, to Chuck O'Dale, uh, seated right here, who uh, graciously stepped in to assist me with a number of presidential duties this year. So I'm sure it was greatly appreciated. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is a babysitter, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I want to extend uh, uh, quite a few other thank yous. Uh, special thank you to our Vice President Al Scott. Uh, Al is there. So Al is uh, responsible for, for the, this evening for organizing our, our guest speaker and, and the, the tickets and, and all sorts of things. So, uh, so thank you again, Al. Well, so a few other special thank yous. Uh, our Secretary, uh, Chris Terran, who is usual, has come through with the audio visuals for this evening. Uh, Eric is our uh, our recorder there in the corner. Uh, Mike Magadam, our outstanding outreach coordinator for the past two years, uh, uh, whose dedication and enthusiasm helped make IYA and our public events this year happen. And uh, Mike uh, is uh, stepping down to, but uh, Mike, we really appreciate all the work you've done these last two years, and uh, we've we've really seen the the impact and the, the interest that the public has uh, has shown in our events. So, uh, Treasurer Hans Brower, I don't know if, I haven't seen Hans this evening, but uh, 
He's out of town. Okay. Uh, he's lent us his considerable financial skills in keeping our center budget going. Uh, this year's meeting chair, Bill Wagstaff. I saw Bill is right here. Uh, putting on some excellent shows for us this year. Uh, councillors uh, Eve DeMare, Stephen Norse, and Carmen Rush for their support of council activities. National representatives uh, Deborah Saravolo. Uh, no, oh no, not anymore. No, no, I know. I think at the start of the year, but or no, no it was last year. Okay, this. My apologies. Okay. But thanks for being astronauts, editor. I knew we had something to thank you for. <laughs> Okay, uh, Bear Matthews, Chuck O'Dale, and uh, so who was, was it, Rob? Rob, uh, Rob. thank you. Uh, Rob Dick, who's also uh, our national rep this year. And uh, all the many center members who served as volunteers, uh, far too many to name in the short time I have here, but you, know, you all know who you are. You made this year and others happen. Uh, my own two years as president are, are now coming to a close, and I look forward to serving the center as past president to my utmost uh, the utmost of my abilities and uh, to seeing uh, fresh blood to come into the into the council so uh, so thank you all for your support these last two years it's been great uh, so as you all know the the R in, in RESC stands for royal and uh, it's tradition each year to toast our patron who is uh, Queen Elizabeth II so um, I invite everybody to uh, raise their glasses to the Queen. A serious note. Um, <laughs> So uh, every year, our annual dinner meeting falls on the week of November 11th, and uh, so in keeping with this occasion, at this point I'd, I'd last, like to ask you all to rise as we observe a minute of silence, in memory of those who are no longer with us. All right, please be seated. Okay. So. Uh, so again, later this evening, we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Samard to give his talk on galaxies like grains of sand. And, uh, but uh, before that, we, we have some excellent uh, cuisine there on display. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to our, our host, uh, Gore, to uh, tell you all about it. Thank you very much, Rob. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Once again, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to Algonquin College. And for the first timers, I do have a surprise for you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, at this time I'll ask you all to remain seated. I will go along table to table at which time I'll invite you to the buffet area. We have one buffet table, but we have two lines, one on the inside and one on the outside. We will try to get you all through the buffet area as quick as possible without the aid of desserts. So we will start. <laughs> We will start down at the far end and not at the near end of the buffet. You'll have your meal, you'll stop just about here where the cheese, where the cheese tray is, and you'll make your way back to the seats. Once you finish your meal, you can then return to the dessert area at any time. I will not bring you to the dessert area orderly. However, we will be bringing uh, coffee and tea. For those of you who like tea, please ask the waiter or waitress for the tea. We'll be putting pots of coffee on the tables for you. The bar is over here, ladies and gentlemen. Those of you who would like to order wines, please feel free to make your way to the bar, and the bartenders will be happy to serve you. But remember one thing, and there's always a but. Those of you who are driving, I ask you to be extra careful if you are drinking. Because someone in the streets, including ourselves, person next to you at the table, could be the person directly in front of you or behind you. And I think we all would like to get home safely this evening. In saying that, ladies and gentlemen, our chef, Brendan, is instrumental in preparing your meal. However, as all chefs do, there's always one thing to forget when they're preparing a meal. So if I can have the lights out and your attention over to Brendan, with a raw 85 pound hip of beef, and my chef said to me, don't worry, 
I'll try to do something for you. Now, Brendan's going to attempt to cook this raw in five pound hip in less than one minute. <laughs> what you can do for me. Oh, oh. Yes. we have a play, ladies and gentlemen. A huge play. With that, you can just, you just with this well done on the outside, and it's being cooked with this from the outside. Uh, medium rare, a little further in, and of course, you can return for the rare portion of the meat. Thank you, Brendan. Job well done. At the beginning of the buffet table, ladies and gentlemen, is draped. Under that is a 300 pound block of ice, which our chefs learn how to carve here. In two hours, 15 minutes, and 21 seconds, and we do time them, Brendan was able to produce this masterpiece for you this evening. But remember one thing. Remember one thing, you're no longer kids, and I don't expect any of you to put your tongue up against this. <laughs> Those, those days are gone. You, you may handle it, you may touch it, whatever you'd like to do, but please don't lick it. <laughs> At the very far end of the buffet table, ladies and gentlemen, is the sweet table. And this is where you will end the evening, of course, not begin the evening. We have a variety of cakes. This is only a portion we were able to bring out at this time. Once you've gone through the main course, I will remove these items, probably squeeze them up front or remove it altogether, and I'll put a variety of other cakes to go with this. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. As I said, remain seated. I will come out table to table. Enjoy your evening. It's a pleasure having you here one more time. Thank you. All right. Lecture. Let's uh, let's give a round of applause for our host this evening. Yeah. I hope you really enjoy uh, coming to Algonquin each year, and uh, and uh, I'm sure you, you found out why with uh, tonight's meal. So, all right. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to invite our vice president, uh, Al Scott, to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Paul. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our guest speaker for this, uh, the 2010 uh, annual dinner of the Ottawa Area C. Uh, Dr. Luke Samard did his uh, bachelor's work at uh, Queen's University uh, and moved on to do his PhD at uh, University of Victoria, after which point he went on to uh, Arizona and California for postdoctoral positions, uh, studying galaxy morphology and uh, he has now uh, been at uh, Hertzberg Institute of Astrophysics for uh, eight years, I believe. Uh, and he's also uh, an adjunct professor uh, continuing his research at U Victoria. And as well as that, he is currently holding the position of uh, science instrument group leader for the 30 meter telescope project. So I think we're going to all enjoy this talk. Uh, he gave a Galileo lecture uh, for the IYA series and he's going to give us uh, the benefit of uh, some of his learning. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about galaxies tonight. It's a real pleasure always to come and talk to RASC members. Uh, I am a, a rare breed amongst uh, professional astronomers because I started as an amateur astronomer and I actually know my constellations. <laughs> <laughs> I also can find messy objects in the sky as well as a few NGCs. My first telescope was a Tasco uh, two-inch refractor. <laughs> My second telescope was a six-inch Mead uh, telescope. And I eventually built a radiative telescope. And as you will see tonight, uh, I get to talk to you about my, uh, my new telescope, which I'm very proud of. As, and, uh, OK, so this is uh, the, um, uh, as part of the International Year of Astronomy, there was a bunch of us that went around Canada to give, to deliver what we call the Galileo Lectures. So it was uh, 10 speakers uh, going across the country delivering some uh, presentation on different uh, research topics. And um, this was last year, 
And this year, for uh, tonight, I put together a, a modified version of my lecture because I heard that some of you were telescope builders. So I included some history of uh, cosmology, some science, and then some telescope building, uh, as you will see. Um, So the, the, uh, the title of the talk is Galaxies Like Grains of Sand, and you'll see in a bit uh, why that is. Um, I include on the front of the presentation one of my favorite pictures. Uh, some of you may recognize these two galaxies. They're quite famous. The top one is M82, Messier 82. The bottom one is Messier 81. This picture was taken with one of the largest uh, digital camera in the world. It's a 340 megapixel camera that's uh, on the Canada France Hawaii telescope. And we use this wonderful camera, which by the way was built by Atomic Energy of France, uh, don't ask me why, uh, <laughs> to conduct one of the best surveys of the, of the sky ever. All right, it all started 400 years ago with this guy, Galileo. 400, yeah, that's. <laughs> It is a tough crowd. <laughs> it is 401, thank you. Mr. Galileo, despite the fact that he was dealing with, uh, had to use uh, what we, by today's standard would be a poor telescope, managed to do some pretty significant discoveries. He observed the phases of Venus. He was puzzled by the rings of Saturn. They look like ears, so he couldn't figure them out. And he made these wonderful observations of the side of Jupiter. And so Mr. Galileo set in motion our, uh, I would say, our journey of discovery of the universe. And I particularly like this page of his logbook because it shows uh, all the Galilean satellites of Jupiter as he observed them back in, um, in 1610. And so um, the reason why, I mean, Galileo, it was a year of uh, International Year of Astronomy because of Galileo. but. As you will see, Mr. Galileo is going to come back later on in this presentation. So he, you know, he did a great things about uh, for the solar system. The next character I want to bring up is this person uh, called Charles Messier. Uh, I must admit that this is not a direct quote from Mr. <laughs> Messier, but this quote is, embodies the spirit of what drove him to make the Messier catalog. This guy did not care one bit about nebulae. He cared about comets. He was a comet hunter and got frustrated that every time he thought he had discovered a new comet, he later on found out it was this nasty nebulae whatever. And so out of this frustration was born the Messier catalog for which he, has be he is best known. He's not known as a comet hunter, although he discovered something like 14 or 15 of them. He's known for the Messier catalog that we all uh, know and love. Uh, because a lot of them are visible with our own telescope. And the reason why I'm bringing in the Messier catalog is to show you that at the time of Messier, there was tremendous confusion in people's mind as to what these nebulae were. Uh, we now know that, you know, for example, the Pleiades is a star cluster, a young star cluster, and th things like this are galaxies of their own. But at the time of, of Charles Messier, People had no idea, so what all he did was catalog all the objects he could see from his Paris apartment and call that the Messier catalog, and it's a mismatch of objects. We had to wait until the early uh, 20s for, to realize that finally some of these nebulae were not at all, at all in our own backyard. They were very distant objects, millions of light years away, and we owe this uh, realization to uh, Mr. Hubble, Edwin Hubble, uh, after which the Hubble Space Telescope was named. Uh, I love this picture because of the smoking the pipe at the telescope. This is man against the universe in its purest form. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he made a fundamental discovery that some of these nebulae are island universes uh, of their own. And uh, that was a pretty dramatic realization. And it came at the time that uh, uh, Einstein was trying to work out the equations for the expansion of the universe. And Einstein was sort of wavering between a static universe and an expanding universe, fudging the equations one, one way or the other, depending on the week, time of the, you know, the week that he was working on these things. Um, and Hubble came along and said, you know what? The universe is expanding. And so Einstein scratched out the term of his equation that kept the universe static. Uh, so it was a pretty big, uh, big discovery. And so when we look at our own Milky Way, 
Uh, we see th things like this. So I've seen some of the be beautiful pictures that were shown before. And this is uh, a set of constellations that is well known to uh, all amateur, the Summer Triangle, made up of Cygnus, Lyra, and Aquila. And the reason why I'm bringing out this configuration is that it shows something that, as a professional astronomer, I find uh, deeply amazing. That is, the sky is not the sky that you think of. The sky is a time machine. Okay? We are looking every night at the biggest time machine out there. And what's amazing is that we have all access to that time machine. You don't need to be in an H.G. Wells uh, movie with uh, you know, a, a thing with a spinning disc and uh, a big lever to pick your year to travel back in uh, or forward in time. Well, in this case, we're going to travel back in time. But the universe is a time machine. So if you look at something as simple as the Summer Triangle, we have uh, Altair, which is down here at the bottom of the triangle a distance of about 11 light years. Now, if you work your way up to Vega, it's at a distance of about 25 light years. Reaching Deneb, Deneb is a super giant star. It's at a distance of 1,600 light years. So by the time you look at Deneb with your eyeballs, the light that you see uh, from Deneb has been traveling through space for two, almost 2,000 years. And to me, that's just amazing, because that means that the further we can look uh, out there in the universe, the further back in time we go. I call my branch of astronomy, cosmology, I actually call it extreme archaeology. Forget those guys working on pyramids that were built in <laughs> 4000 BC. My PhD thesis was on about events that took place six billion years ago. And so talking about the summer triangle and all the stars that we see in the sky, this is a local neighborhood. If you keep going, you come across these things called the Glover Clusters. So here's a picture of Messier 22 taken with the CFHD, the Canada France Hawaii Telescope, and this big camera I talked about. So these massive star clusters, which contain a million stars each, are on the outskirt of uh, the Milky Way. This one is about 22,000 light years or so. And they're still reachable with our eyes. You can see Messier 13 in a, in a dark site, and, or a small telescope, and yet, the light has traveled for thousands, tens of thousands of years through space before reaching us. If you're lucky enough to go to the southern hemisphere, you'll come across the Magellanic Clouds. These satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, although there's, there's some recent debate as to whether these clouds are actually uh, satellite of the Milky Way, one of them seems to be just zooming by the Milky Way for the first time, uh, are at a distance of almost 200,000 light years. And so in 1987, when we saw the supernova go off, well, the supernova actually blew up 200,000 years ago. And the farthest object that you can see in the sky is the Andromeda galaxy. You don't need a telescope, you just need a dark site. And by the time you know where to find this object and you look at it, the light that you see has been traveling through space for 2.5 million years. Ask yourself where we were 2.5 million years ago, and that gives you an idea of, of the of the time scales involved. It's just amazing. And yet, this is just the local neighborhood. We can go far beyond this. You keep going, and you encounter spiral uh, galaxies. I like to use this picture because we believe that this is how our mil own Milky Way looks like. Uh, we have the downtown core, which we call the bulge. The solar system would be sort of in the, in the, in the um, suburbs, about 33,000 light years from the, from the center of, of the Milky Way. And uh, you see these vast spiral arms of gas and dust and stars. They're beautiful structure. And one of the things that we're trying to figure out is where these beautiful structures came from. Now, th these spiral galaxies are incredible. They're giant disks. Uh, the diameter of, of a typical galaxy like this one is 100,000 light years. And if you look at it on the side, what you see now is the disk edge on, and it's only about 300 light years thick. It's an incredibly thin disk. So how can we have these gigantic structure that are incredibly thin and yet remain stable over billions of years? It's, it's uh, one of the challenge of explaining how galaxies form and evolved. Another object that many of you are familiar with is the Sombrero Galaxy. So as you can see now, we're moving towards a different type of galaxy. You, have, you still have a, some kind of disk of dust, but then you've got this much more prominent halo that we call the bulge. And this is uh, what we call an S0 galaxy. And it's at a distance of 30 million light years. If you didn't see in the corner, I keep the, uh, the distance 
the mileage at the bottom there to give you an idea of the scale. So even though this object is still visible with a small telescope, uh, we're looking at distances of 30 million years into the past. Messier 82, a really active galaxy. Um, it's undergoing, uh, we call it in astronomy the Christmas tree uh, galaxy because it lights up with supernovae like a Christmas tree. And the effect of all these supernovae explosions is pushing off the gas outside of the galaxy, and this galaxy is undergoing tremendous disruption. Finally, uh, the most massive galaxy in the universe is Messier 87. It sits at the center of this gigantic cluster of galaxies known as the Virgo Cluster. It is the most massive uh, galaxy we know of in the universe. It's uh, also uh, known as an elliptical galaxy. You don't see anything, no dust, no spiral arms, just a smooth distribution of light, except for one thing down in the middle. You see this little jet here, and it's coming from a supermassive black hole at the core of it, uh, Messier 87. One of the biggest discoveries in recent years in astronomy is that there seems to be a supermassive black hole at the core of every single galaxy, including the Milky Way. Uh, our own uh, black hole is four million times the mass of the sun. And I'm going to get back to these black hole in a second. Uh, they're just uh, quite a challenge to explain how you can assemble that much mass in over the lifetime of the universe. Now, galaxies are like people. They like to get together. <laughs> this one is also a well-known object. Anybody recognize it? Stefan's Quintet. And I use this uh, picture to show that galaxies can be found in pretty tight groups. So if you look at these two galaxies, they're so close to each other that they're distorting e one another. Okay, they, their uh, mutual gravitational forces are having a profound effect on their structure. So galaxies that get too close actually can get really distorted, eventually merge together, and form a bigger galaxy. And now if you go even um, to more extreme structures in the universe, you end up with something like this. This is a cluster of galaxies called Abel 1689. It is the most massive galaxy cluster in the universe. And guess what? Einstein, sitting in his desk uh, in the, uh, at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, working out the equation of relativity, was right. He predicted these arcs that you see here. And these arcs are the result of gravitational lensing. The mass of the cluster is so enormous that it distorts spacetime around it. And then as the light goes through that distorted spacetime, it feels like it's going through a lens. And so what you see here are the lensed images of background galaxies behind Abel 1689. Amazing cluster to watch. This is a, a, a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. If you keep going even further to the edge of the observable universe, you end up with pictures like this. So this is a picture, a uh, very famous field. It's the Hubble Deep Field. It's one of the deepest images ever taken. And what's remarkable about this picture is that every single object on this image is a galaxy. There's not a single star on that image. And um, that's why I chose this, uh, the title of my talk to be galaxies like green, the grains of sand. When I look at a picture like this, and wherever we point our telescopes, we see things like this everywhere. And one of the challenges is, there's something funny about this picture. I don't know if you've, if you've seen it before, and if you've seen it before, whether you were ever puzzled by the fact that when you look at some of these galaxies over here and down there, they don't look anywhere, anything like the beautiful spiral disk that you see, the, the so-called grand design spiral. They look um, like they've had a rough time. Uh, they look anemic. They look distorted. They're smaller. So one of the things that we're trying to understand is how do you go from these tiny little Lego blocks to the big galaxies like the Milky Way that we see today in the time available? You'd say, ah, you have billions of years to put the galaxy together. Well, a, billion years is, a few billion years is not a whole lot when you're trying to put together something that's uh, you know, uh, uh, 100 billion times the mass of the sun. So let me show you a, a movie that tries to show what we, how we think uh, these uh, galaxies are formed. It's not um, what I would call an intuitive process because it looks more like destruction rather than construction. So here we go. Okay, so we start, I'm gonna stop it here. On the left-hand side, you're gonna have a top view. This is a computer simulation. Uh, so this is, uh, you'll see things appearing soon uh, from the top and then from the side. 
And then here is time in a funny kind of unit that astronomers call redshift. So here we go. There's nothing on the picture because there's no light in the universe. Now the first stars were born. And if I stop it here, if you look at these, uh, the, the color is the age of the star. So a young star is blue. And as you will see, as the time goes on, you'll get red stars, which are older stars. But look at this picture already. Doesn't it remind you of what you saw in the Hubble Deep Field, the small, anemic, uh, distorted galaxies? Here they are in this very relatively simple simulation. We already see the first galaxies as we observe them in the sky today. And if I let it go, what you're going to see now is these smaller galaxies coming together, crashing together, actually. That's what I mean by it look a lot more like uh, uh, destructions rather than construction. And, but this is how you do it. You build a bigger and bigger galaxy by smashing smaller galaxies together. And uh, this goes on for quite a while. So right now, we're at about uh, 10 billion years in the past. And you can see that from the top, sometimes you'll see uh, spiral arms show up and disappear. Spiral arms actually are transient things. They don't stick around for long. And um, eventually what we're going to end up with is a galaxy that looks like the Sombrero galaxy. As, as time goes on, right now we're at about 6 billion years in the past. This is now what astronomers call the uh, nearby universe. Uh, but you can see all the red stars that have been around you see the blue stars in the middle, uh, of the, uh, in the center of the galaxy, and then you see some spiral arms showing up. Here they are. So even with a relatively, nowadays this simulation is fairly simple. This, this is what we were doing back in 2000. I kept this simulation because it looks like the Hubble Deep Field. This simulation in 2000 took four months on a computer to do, uh, on the fastest computer in the world. Now we, we do a far better job, but you can see now a beautiful disk and a halo, the bulge, like you see in the Sombrero galaxy. So even with a relatively simple simulation, we're able to reproduce the basic structure of galaxy. Now, there's something very wrong with this thing. All you see here is stars, nothing else. We now know that stars are a tiny fraction of the universe. Most of the universe reside into dark matter, which we have no idea what dark matter is, and dark energy, which we have even less idea than of what it is than dark matter. It's a huge scandal. The, the astronomers are missing about, uh, well, you know, 75% of the universe or more. Uh, we don't like to brag about this because it's, it's a, bit, a bit of a scandal, but we're making, we're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and so this is what the stars are doing. What you don't see is the dark matter. So what I'm going to show you now is a simulation of what the dark matter is doing. So on the next movie, what you're going to see are not stars, but dark matter. So here we go. Well, you can see, if I start with uh, distribution of dark matter and I let the gravity take over, what you end up with is not a random structure. You end up with a web of filaments all over the place. It looks like we call it the cosmic web. And th the galaxies that we see today form along the filaments of the cosmic web. And it's just a, another, uh, uh, I would say, construction derby, uh, as opposed to demolition derby. And then you can see all these dark matter halos of particles that we don't understand. All we know is uh, that they interact with gravity. Uh, there is no radiation coming from dark matter. Uh, we haven't observed any uh, dark matter directly. All we've seen is the gravitational signature of the dark matter. And we've tried to simulate them in the computer like that. So this is what the Milky Way, our Milky Way, should look like if you had dark matter uh, glasses on. And what we can do with a simulation like this is you can actually fly through it and expect it, measure its structure as a function of time. And from measuring the structure of dark matter, try to explain the observations we're making to determine what particle makes up dark matter. Um, I'm happy to report that we may have a breakthrough in dark matter soon, given not new telescopes, but new particle accelerators like the one at, in Geneva at the CERN laboratory. The answer might actually come from underground rather than from the universe. So that's kind of an interesting twist to think that uh, one of the ultimate answers in astronomy is going to come from particle physics. Now, this uh, process of taking small Lego blocks and building larger and larger galaxies is 
hasn't stopped. It's still going on. So you might ask yourself, as resident of the Milky Way galaxy, are we in danger of a collision? The answer is yes. We are, we're on a collision path uh, with our neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy. And so we're going in for an head-on collision. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is that it's going to occur in about one billion years. So I think we don't have to worry about that one. But I'm going to show you what happens to the solar system when the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way meet together. Here we go. So here's the Milky Way. Here's time. The solar system is the red dot that you see going around. Everything is fine. We're in a nice circular orbit. Uh, we go around every 250 million years. And then here's the, Andro the bad, evil Andromeda galaxy. <laughs> in the corner, showing, and then they're going to have a bit of a dance because we're rearranging the simulation. And then they come, they're going to come uh, through the first pass, and then you're going to see that the solar system is going to go on an interesting journey. And here we go, first pass, toom. So now the solar system is going through by the center, out in the outskirt. It's going to go back in. And now the Andromeda galaxy is not happy with the first pass. It wants more. It's coming back for seconds. You know, this is dessert. Here we go. One three, four, and eventually becomes a single galaxy. So in, a, in six billion years, we will be one and only with our friend, the uh, Andromeda galaxy. So I hope by the, showing you all these pictures of galaxies in the universe that I conveyed the sense of the vastness of the universe, but also the fact that it, it is a time machine like uh, you may not have thought of it uh, before. And if you're going to uh, travel through time, you need a machine to do it. So here's a little cartoon showing you uh, uh, in one picture the, the entire history of the universe. Uh, let there be light at the beginning uh, with what we think were quantum fluctuations in the vacuum itself. These quantum fluctuations led to seeds of structures and these seeds over time under the, inf the, the effect of gravity grew bigger and bigger to give us the galaxies that we see today. So everything came from the Big Bang all the way to the local universe. So we start uh, after the Big Bang. Uh, obviously, the Big Bang was really hot. Um, it was messy. But then the universe cooled down to a point where everything was dark. It was a, we called it the Dark Ages. It lasted about 400 million years after the Big Bang. And after 400 million years, the first stars were born. And after that, galaxies, you can see first stars. The first stars were very different than the sun. And then these first stars died, uh, created new stars, and then went into new galaxies. And over time, we ended up with the galaxies, the planets, and um, the stars that we see today. Now, this is uh, in one cartoon, 13.3 billion years. And um, I'm going to show you now a machine that can survey all of that cosmic time uh, with, uh, in one single shot. That machine is uh, known as the 30-meter uh, telescope. It's a new project that we're working on. Uh, it will be the uh, largest telescope in the world when it goes on, on sky in 2019. Um, as it's not a very original name. It's named the 30-meter telescope because the primary mirror has a diameter of 30 meter. Uh, also, by the time we picked the acronym, we're not sure whether it was going to be, uh, say, 29 to 39. So we, with the acronym, we're safe. With TMT, no matter what the diameter ended up being, we were still in the right range. Um, so the 3-meter the, uh, the telescope is uh, an interesting project because, for one thing, it looks the way it does. This picture, by all the pictures I'm going to show are not cute uh, artist con uh, pictures. They're real engineering design. Uh, I'm going to show you pictures that, uh, of certain parts of the observatory, and they're going to look that way when the observatory is operational in 2019. Um, this, tells, this observatory looks the way it does because of Canada. Canada has had a distinctive signature on that project. We are responsible for delivering the dome, this wonderful, uh, it's called the Collat Dome, which I'll uh, uh, discuss a bit later. The Collat Dome is being designed in Vancouver. We're responsible for the structure of the telescope. And uh, we're also responsible for one of the main instruments for that telescope. In fact, the instrument that will make it all work. The project is a collaboration between Canada, University of California, 
the California Institute of Technology, and our recent addition to the partnership are Japan, China, and India. So we're, we have six partners, and uh, we're all trying to uh, figure out how we can put together the partnership to build a telescope. Uh, on the technical level, it's, it's very advanced. Now let me show you the power of this thing in terms of looking out into deep space. So here's a picture of the Hubble Deep Field. So let's take this little galaxy and then ask ourselves, what would the Hubble Space Telescope, which is the best, one of the best telescopes we have out there, it's out there in space. Because it's in space, there's no blurring of the atmosphere. So it's getting incredibly sharp images, the best images that you can get with a 2.4 meter telescope. The Hubble would see something like this. The TMT will, see the same, will observe the same galaxy with this resolution. It will have a resolution 10 times better than the space telescope. So you might ask yourself, well, how can you do this? You're, you're not going to ship this thing on the space shuttle or anything like that. It's the size of a 747. Um, it turns out that we have some new technology to get rid of the effect of the atmosphere. So, you know, when you look outside and you see the star twinkling, it's very pretty, it's very romantic, it's awful for astronomy because it means that the atmosphere is very unstable. Uh, so twinkle, twinkle, little star, oh, I wonder how you are. Um, it's bad. Twinkling is bad. And so this atmosphere that we love and breathe is just a disaster for astronomers. So thankfully, we have a way to get rid of the atmosphere without killing ourselves. So let me show you um, a star taken at high speed. So this is, if you're able to take fast images of a star, this is what the star would look like. It looks like a mess. You can see it, it's nowhere near a sharp point of light as you would expect if you were in space. And that's entirely due to the effect of the atmosphere. So if I let it run, you're going to see this mess turn into a beautiful image all of a sudden because I turn on my magic box. Here we go. So now, this is still observed from the ground, but the image is as good as if it was taken from space. How do we do this? It turns out that ca Canadians are world leaders in uh, this field called adaptive optics. So let me show you how adaptive optics uh, work uh, by showing you a little movie. Okay, so this is, by the way, the Gemini telescope on Mauna Kea. And uh, the movie start by doing something that we're to we're, we tell the general public never to do, which is to grab the most powerful laser in the world, stick it on top of your telescope, and fire it up into the sky. Okay, that's, that's what this movie is going to show you. It's going to show you a laser beam going all the way into the sky. So going along the, the, the telescope. You see the big island of Hawaii. And the laser goes all the way up to 90 kilometers. At 90 kilometers, it turns out there's a layer of sodium atoms, and they come from micrometeorites. So you, every, you know, all the time you get these micrometeorites hitting the atmosphere of the Earth, and they deposit this layer of uh, sodium atoms, and your laser excites those atoms to create um, laser stars. So if we go back down from the ground, what I'm going to show you now is what the, the laser guide star looks like. So we are able to create artificial stars. And then we look at these stars with a special sensor that measure the distortion of the stars due to the blurring of the atmosphere. And then we feed these uh, measurement to a special kind of mirror, a mirror that can dance around or deform itself faster than the atmosphere to cancel the effect of, of uh, of the blowing of the atmosphere. So you see now the star looks really bad. And so when the light comes from a distant star, before it hits the atmosphere, it's perfectly plain. But here it looks like a, like a bunch of crooked potato chips. And so if you're able to measure how crooked these potato chips are and then feed the signal back to this dancing mirror, you end up with perfectly uh, flat light waves as you should. And instead of having this really bad star image, you get a beautifully clear image as if it was taken from space. This is not uh, science fiction. We now do it on a routine basis. Uh, here's a picture of two telescopes on top of Mauna Kea. This is the Keck telescope, and this is the Gemini telescope. Both of them are shooting a laser up in the sky to do this type of measurement. Um, I'll leave it to your imagination what happens when you cross the beams. Um, <laughs> 
And uh, we do this on a rut routine basis. So, so now, using our ground-based telescope, we're able to get, in some applications, images that are as good or better than the ones we get from space. It doesn't mean you shouldn't go to space. There are things that space telescope can do that we still can't do from the ground. But if I apply this technology to a 30-meter telescope, this is what I can do. If I take a loony, I can see a loony with my telescope, my TMT telescope, at a distance of 800 kilometers. So if the loony is in Washington, D.C., and TMT is in Ottawa, I would have no problem seeing it. Another way of putting it, if I take the full moon, the diameter of the full moon, and divide it in two million parts, I can see four of those parts with TMT. I mean, we can observe things on a scale of four milliarc seconds. And that's the resolution of our telescope. And when you can do that sort of imaging, uh, all kinds of cool stuff happens. The first one is uh, we can s look at the cosmic web of neutral hydrogen that is present after the Big Bang and measure the structure of that cosmic web like it's never been done before with the hope of understanding the distribution of galaxies that form along the filaments and maybe something to learn about dark matter and dark energy. I mentioned supermassive black holes. So here are the stars around the center of the Milky Way. We actually can observe them in the infrared. And we see them zooming around this star, uh, this empty spot uh, marked by a star in this picture. And by the motion of these stars, we're able to tell that there's this supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Now that's known. It's nothing new. We're going to confirm that, no problem. But what we're going to be able to see is as the, ro the black hole rotates, it drags around space-time, it, around itself, it wraps itself in space-time, and we're going to be able to measure the distortion of the orbits of those stars due to the rotation of space-time around the supermassive black hole in, at the core of our Milky Way. I'm particularly, uh, I don't work on exoplanets and life in the universe, but one thing that this telescope will do really well is give us a better understanding of planets around other stars. The first thing we're going to be able to do is if you look at this uh, star here and the scale, one astronomical unit is where the Earth, the, the planets like the Earth are found, terrestrial planets, and you can see all kinds of interesting molecules in space, like water. How do we take those molecules, which are present throughout a uh, protoplanetary disk, how do we take those molecules in space and put them at the surface of new planets? We don't know, but with TMT, we're going to be able to observe molecules being deposited at the surface of new form, uh, newly formed uh, planets. One thing that we hope to do is find actual traces of life. And I'm not talking about ET phone home. Um, it's actually uh, kind of cooler than that. So here's a star, and you have a planet uh, around that, uh, passing in front of that star. So the light is going, the Earth is way, way, way over there. And so the, light, the rays from the star will go through the atmosphere of the exoplanet. And if we can measure the spectrum of these light rays that go through the atmosphere of the planet, we can measure the chemical abundance of atmosphere of planets around other stars. So if we can measure the chemical abundances of those atmospheres and we find something like oxygen, oxygen exists in the atmosphere of the Earth because of life at the surface of the Earth. If there was no life, oxygen would quickly react with a bunch of other stuff and disappear from the atmosphere. If we find significant amount of oxygen in an exoplanetary atmosphere, it would be a strong evidence for life. And in fact, we're going to be able to tell you whether a planet is covered by water or whether it's covered by a forest. Uh, or just plain rocks. In terms, I mean, you can use TMT to look at the distant universe, but what about our own solar system? Here's a picture of Europa, one of the satellites of Jupiter discovered by Mr. Galileo. Europa is covered by, an, by an, a, a thick uh, layer of ice. Underneath that layer of ice, we think that there is an, a liquid ocean that's being warmed up by the tidal interaction with Jupiter. Sometimes the, something happens and the layer cracks, some new ice flows through the cracks and then quickly freezes at the surface. Well, we can observe that new ice with TMT and figure out what the salt content of the ocean of Europa is. And that salt content would tell us whether life is possible or not on, on Europa. We can also observe uh, erupting volcanoes of ice and, and, uh, and fire across the entire solar system. Another fun satellite of Jupiter, Io, is covered by volcanoes. And so currently, this is what we can do with our telescopes. 
this is the next generation uh, system for current telescope. And this is what TMT will, will see. Now you might ask yourself, wh why, why do you want to observe Io with a telescope from the Earth? I mean, we have space probes. They're flying right above this thing as we speak. Right? We had the Galileo uh, mission. We had the Cassini mission. They take very detailed pictures because they're right there. The robots are right there. So why is this interesting to do with something like TMT? The answer is the probe cannot cover everything at the same time. So what the probe does when it zooms around, say, Saturn, is it takes a snapshot and then moves on. Well, if something interesting happens in the meantime, the probe, probe will never see it. Where a telescope from the ground, you can actually observe the moon every single night and measure uh, the, the weather on, on, on Titan, for example. So even though probes are out there flying around, we actually do some science with our ground-based telescope that they can't do. Okay, so TMT is gonna go on the Big Island of Hawaii. Uh, to be more specific, Mauna Kea. If you've been to the Big Island, you've got two volcanoes, Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa. Mauna Kea is a dormant volcano, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> it's one of the best sites for astronomy in the world. Uh, you, they tell you it's dormant, but I was observing one day and we had 22 earthquakes and they thought that the, the volcano was coming back to life. Um, one of the earthquakes took place during observing and that was kind of an exciting experience. So if you look at the, um, uh, the mountain, so if you, um, uh, okay, so let me orient you. Uh, so here is the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. When you arrive at the summit, you arrive this way. Um, and then there's Gemini Telescope here. The biggest telescope in the world are the Keck Telescopes over here. Uh, this is the Subaru Telescope. Uh, James uh, Clerk Maxwell Telescope, so this is another uh, Canadian telescope. Uh, so Canada has a share in JCMT. We have a share in Gemini, a share in Gemini, uh, Gemini over here, and CFHT. And so when you arrive at the summit, instead of turning around, turning uh, right to go to CFHT, you keep going straight, and then you go past the summit to a plateau known as 13 North. And that's where we're going to build uh, TMT. There's no room at the summit itself to build a telescope the size of a 747. So if I show you uh, a picture, so here's the Keck Telescope, Subaru. Um, you're looking towards, uh, I think, uh, the Kona coast. And so this is 13 North, which is large enough for us to build our telescope. It's at an altitude of 4,200 meters. Mauna Kea is well known as one of the best sites on the planet. And that's where we're going to be putting uh, TMT. Here's a picture of the observatory. This is a real design that we use for a construction permit. So when you do renovations on your house, uh, you get plans. We have construction plans for this facility. There are two things I'd like to draw your attention to. The first one is the dome. The dome, as you can see, reflects the sky. And the, the other thing is the building is brown to match the ground, the landscape around it. One thing that was really important is how do we camouflage something the size of a 747, so that when you are at sea level, you don't see it. And the answer is make the dome look like the sky and make your facilities look like the ground. And that's what we had to do uh, to satisfy the, the permit uh, requirements for the, for the site. Uh, uh, so in here, you're going to have all the labs for storing the mirrors, uh, recoding the mirrors. Uh, there's uh, generators. Uh, there's going to be a visitor gallery. So keep that in mind next time, you know, when you come up to Hawaii and uh, TMT is in operation, we're going to have a very nice uh, visitor gallery for you to see our, our baby. And uh, this is a real design, real construction design. To put, you just, to put it in scale, um, this is the TMT dome with respect to the largest telescopes in the world, the Keck telescopes, which are 10 meters in diameter, each one of them. And so it's a substantially larger facility. As I said earlier, uh, this is a distinctive uh, Canadian uh, observatory. It's using a new kind of dome called the culotte. And the culotte is kind of interesting. Uh, you have an opening. Instead of a nice shutter, uh, a, a typical shutter, you have a, a cap, okay? And, uh, sorry, the, the plug. And the plug is 31 meters in diameter, just a bit bigger than the mirror. Then the plug sits on an inclined plane at 45 degrees. And that whole part is called the cap. And the cap sits on an horizontal uh, base that rotates horizontally, okay? So if I just uh, show you the whole thing in motion, you see the plug opening up, we open the flaps, the, the cap moves on an incline, and then the base moves on an incline. So by the uh, 
simultaneous motion of the two components, so you can put the dome anywhere in the sky. And that dome is extremely efficient structurally, uh, and uh, it protects the telescope from the wind. Now, what I love about this design is um, it was built by a, a Canadian company, and the Canadian company built some of the first domes uh, on Mauna Kea. Using the technology from the domes, they built, uh, they, they folded that new technology into roller coasters. So <laughs> they built some of the best roller coasters down in the United States. So when you go to uh, Walt <coughs> Disney World or Six Flags, some of the newest um, uh, roller coasters use telescope dome technology. And then what he did is they took that roller coaster technology and folded it back into the dome design. So this thing here is a roller coaster track. And it's my secret desire when the telescope is being built to ride that track. <laughs> Don't tell my project manager, please. And so by mo moving those two parts, you can point the telescope anywhere in the world, and it's uh, the dome that we intend to build. The dome will be 66 meters in diameter. Just to give you an idea, I keep saying a Boeing uh, 747. I s I'm sort of exaggerating. The, wing, the wingspan of a 747 is 69 meters. And so we're not quite there to fit it in, but uh, it's going to be a pretty big dome. Some sizes for the, uh, the telescope itself. Oops, wrong one. Here's uh, some dimensions. So the, the primary mirror is 30 meters in diameter. The optical axis of the telescope is 23 meters. And the top of the telescope is 51 meters. So what happens is the light comes from the sky, is reflected off the primary mirror, goes up the second, to the secondary mirror, which is the size, it's 3.6 meters in diameter. It's the size of the Canada France Hawaii telescope. <laughs> it goes down to this third mir uh, mirror, and the, this mirror spins around and can deflect the light either on this side or to this side where the instruments are. Uh, just to give you an idea, this instrument here, uh, which looks like just a big square, is the size of, uh, of the largest telescope in the world today. Okay? And then I put my uh, institute in Victoria up for scale in this picture. So here's a little animation showing you the light path uh, through the telescope. So the light comes from the sky, hits the primary mirror, up the secondary, and then up to the tertiary, and then it sends the beam to this instrument. It rotates a bit, can point to the other instrument, rotate a tiny more, oh, all the way down, this way. And then, the, so all these things are instruments. And these instruments are, this one is the size of a semi-trailer truck. This one is the size of the largest telescope in the world. And even the smallest box is uh, bigger than a, than a large vehicle. Just to give you an idea. I'm responsible for all the boxes that you see on both sides of the, of the telescope which sometimes keep me up at night. Here's uh, uh, the primary mirror of TMT uh, with respect to other big telescopes in the world. So we have the, the five meter telescope, Hale telescope, uh, Palomar, which for decades was the largest telescope in the world. That was super superseded by the Keck telescope, which pioneered the first segmented mirror telescope. So you cannot build a 10 meter mirror or a 30 meter telescope. You need to build little segments that you then put together to make a big one. So Keck had uh, 36 segments. Each segment was 1.8 meter in diameter. We're going to have 492 segments, each one 1.4 uh, meter in diameter. So each one of our segment is the size of a reasonable telescope, a 1.4 meter telescope. And what happens is as you move the telescope around the sky, you have to keep the, all those segments playing nice together so that the, the, all those different segments act as a single perfect mirror to reflect the light from the sky. So here's a, another picture of the primary mirror showing you the back structure. Here's a, a worker a technician for scale. So you can see all the back uh, structure of the, of the primary mirror. Here is where the, the tertiary mirror is going to go. If I zoom into seven segments, so uh, here are the mirrors. And at the back of the mirror, each mirror has a mechanical hand to massage the shape of the segment. So as you move around the sky, you have 492 mechanical hands under computer control that can massage each segment independently to get the best single mirror out there on the planet. And here are the, all the mechanisms. So the, the, the yellow part are um, the mechanical hands. Uh, the big boxes are pistons. Uh, the little boxes are edge sensors to figure out each mirror must measure 
where it is with respect to its neighbors. And that's done all the time. So each mirror goes, you know, so and so, such a, that segment is off by that much. We need to adjust each other to be perfect shape. If I'm at the back of the primary mirror, you can see this space here. Uh, here are the mechanical hands, we call them the whiffle trees. And there's enough space for somebody to be standing inside the mirror structure itself. And if you were that technician trying to fix something at the back of the telescope, this is what you would see. These, again, are real engineering things. This is what you would see in 2019. Uh, you will see in 2019 if you uh, ever get a chance to walk through the primary mirror of the TMT. Here's a picture of our secondary mirror. It's the size of CFHT, the Canada France Hawaii Telescope, 3.6 meter in diameters. Um, and uh, what's really cool, so here's the mirror itself. At the back of the mirror is a 20 inch telescope. And the 20 inch telescope is used to launch six laser guide stars at the same time. So we can create a constellation of artificial stars that we can use to measure the turbulence of the atmosphere. And so here's a, a technician fixing the, the telescope with all the laser beam generator and so on. Here's a picture of the structure of the telescope. Just to give you an idea for size, here's an astronomer with uh, her or his arm like this, perhaps in dismay that something is not working. <laughs> but as you can see, it looks like a lonely astronomer because it, uh, that, that person is very far uh, above the ground, 23 meters. This is the level of details that we're looking at. Here are the elevators, the catwalk and the, the guardrails, uh, the lasers, uh, the instruments. So here, are, each cylinder is a big instrument. The box is the adaptive optic system that removes the turbulence of the atmosphere. And that's a Canadian uh, contribution to the project. And so and everything is blue is being designed in Canada. So we're as I said earlier, we're responsible for the dome, the structure of the telescope, and the magic AO box. Here's another picture showing you the telescope pointing uh, up to the zenith. So you can see all the different segments. It's a jagged edge uh, mirror. Um, and then you get some electronics. So, I mean, we, we're down to figuring out where the electronics goes on this thing. So it's a fairly advanced stage of design. And here's the back of the mirror. This is a, a catwalk to go from one platform to the other. And uh, you can see all the, the structure at the back of this uh, gigantic 30 meter uh, mirror. I'm going to show you now a, a fly through uh, the observatory. So what we're going to do, here's the cap opening up with the flaps. Here we go. We're going to plunge down um, through down to the past the CFHT. And then we're, you see now all the different segments, 492 segments. You see the tertiary mirror. You see the image of the secondary mirror into the primary mirror. You can see the big spectrograph. And you can see all the vents on the side of the dome. And then we're going to fly out. You can see people for scale. So each one of these vents, there are 115 vents. They're the size of a large garage door. And then the, the dome is moving into position. And the night, night falls. And then we're going to launch our laser beam. And that's how TMT is going to look like uh, at night. Well, we're going to turn off the, the light in the dome but, uh, <laughs> and the light for the entrance. But, but the laser will be there. And the building certainly is going to look like that. And I think it's going to make for a, a very impressive site. So I really invite you to come and visit us in 2018 when everything is on sky, hopefully. Thank you very much. Yes. What kind of computer do you have running this? I assume it's not a Commodore 64. <laughs> okay, so what kind of computer do we have? Uh, it's, not, it's indeed not a, Com a Commodore 64, I, I do, although I love my Commodore 64. <laughs> Actually, my first computer was a Commodore PET. Um, yeah. Um, so it turns out, so to do uh, the adaptive optics calculation that takes out the blurring effect of the atmosphere, you need a computer that does not exist yet. It has to be the most powerful computer on the planet. And it's actually being designed in, in Canada as well. And um, when I say it's the most powerful computer in the world, it's the most powerful computer for doing only one type of calculation and one type only. The type of calculation that needs to be done is actually imprinted in the circuitry of the computer. So it's not like you can load up window on this thing and start you know, playing games, although that would be <laughs> a lot of fun. But um, it, it is the fastest computer 
in the world, and it does one thing only, but it does it really well. And I should say that the type of calculations that we need to do to remove the effect of the atmospheres are exactly the same type of calculations that you need to make in a medical scanner when you do tomography of the human body. And so there's actually quite a bit of overlap between astronomy and medical science. In fact, we had a, a physician visit us at the observatory, and we're talking about this stuff, and he goes, I just can't believe you're working on this stuff, and we don't know about it. And uh, so we have to do a better job of also talking about this because there's quite a bit of overlap there. Not to mention human vision. So one thing that this, uh, these AO systems can do is give you better than 20-20 vision. It can also be used to study the human retina to look for disease in your eyeballs. So quite powerful techniques, and we're deep in the center of this thing. It's quite nice for Canada. Yeah. Uh, yes, at the back? Oh yeah, that's a, <laughs> yeah, very good question. So maybe uh, if you allow me to flip back, that's a very good question. So uh, maybe let me see if I can, uh, find something um, that can show it better. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna actually go and go to here, back. Here we go. Oops, no, no, go. Okay, here we go. Okay, so as you can see, the question is, how do I grab one of these segments to take it out of the telescope? and take it down to the coding chamber to be recoded, because we have to recode these segments every few years. How do you do it without smashing all the other segments? It's actually pretty scary, but it turns out that, uh, so the way we do it is at the back of each segment, there's a jack, and you jack the segment out of the plane of the mirror, and then we have a crane that will go and grab the segment and take it out and put it down onto, in, into the coding chamber. It turns out that these cranes are not anything exotic, they exist already. Uh, we have some great videos of somebody that's reaching with horizontally one of these cranes, and the operator is just sitting with two joysticks, and it's reaching above a, s a flat surface over 30 meters and grabbing things with a very good precision. So those... Yeah, so um, we have to do it. Uh, we have to cycle all the segments essentially every, uh, if I remember correctly, it's four or five years, although that's dependent on the type of coding that we're going to use. If the coding is really good and durable, uh, we'll be able to push it a bit longer. But uh, we, we expect to be constantly exchanging segments to, to keep the mirror clean. We're also going to use uh, CO2 uh, snow to wash the, the mirror. And how do you do that? How do you reach it? Yeah, so how do you reach so, uh, basically, uh, you know how people uh, wash the windows of a skyscraper? Scraper, excuse me. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to have people in baskets with a, a wand, and they're going to be. Uh, <laughs> it's just a. Uh, you know. Seriously. <laughs> That's uh, that was the latest thing. But I mean, uh, if somebody has a better idea, if uh, you know, one thing that we need to, to close the loop on is that there are uh, companies that specialize in exotic. Um, uh, uh, cleaning scenarios and handling scenarios out there that uh, we, we've had some preliminary contacts with to try to help us solve some of these uh, challenges. Because the other one is, is um, one problem is how do you take this thing out? This thing is the size of a, it's a 3.5 meter telescope. How do you take it out through the structure of the telescope without dropping it by mistake through the primary mirror? So it means that you need to put the telescope at horizon and then have something that goes and grabs it and lifts it through the structure of the telescope down to the floor of the observatory. And so we've had a lot of fun talking about cranes in the project. <laughs> All kinds of cranes and uh, uh, crazy scenarios. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir? Uh, you mentioned about the cycling the mirrors. Is that a spherical surface, or is it going to be a complex it's a, it's a, Yeah, it's a parabola. It's a Ricci, uh, Ricci Cretien design. No, so what we do is we have a spare. So the, the mirror is, has a six-fold uh, symmetry. So we need uh, 492 divided by six spares. So there's something like 82-ish or 80 uh, spares. So when you replace one of those spares, you, just, you, can, uh, you can just replace it with its spare. So there's never a gap in the mirror itself. Because believe it or not, for some of the science that when you want to image an exoplanet around another star, any gap in the mirror is a big problem. So you, you, mu you cannot uh, afford to have gaps in the mirror. We're, we're trying to be that precise. Uh, how are the gaps narrowed down? That's, that's the creases in between the, the mirrors. That, I'm curious about that. How do you do that? Uh, uh, so the question is, how do you decrease the gaps between the mirrors? So, so what we have is we have a, um, a set of sensors. 
And the sensors measure the gaps between the segments and try to keep everything aligned in the most optimal yeah, what's way. What's the tolerance for that? Uh, it's millimeters. It's tiny. Yeah. It's not even millimeters. It's less than millimeters. And it still has an effect on your images. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Any, any um, out of phase uh, position ma uh, looks like a phase error. And so the, 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 the sharpness of the image is affected. And then you end up with uh, structure and your, uh, we call it the point spread function. So if I take the image of a star, what you should see is just a perfect point of light. But because of phase errors, you end up with speckles and things like that that look like exoplanets. And you don't want those in your observations. If you're trying to look at a faint planet, uh, you don't want to mistake it for an optical aberration of your system. Is there a way to compensate for that? Like oh, is it, you can yeah. create an algorithm or something? Oh, yeah. We have, uh, we have a group, uh, control group. That, that's all you do is develop algorithms for that. Yeah. I had an earlier question, too, where you talk about dark matter, how, how the answers to dark matter came from the Hadron Collider. Yes. Was that, does that have anything to do with the experiment last week? Okay, so the question is, uh, when I mentioned that the uh, dark matter um, will be this, might come, uh, might be discovered in, at CERN, um, so they're trying to recreate the Big Bang uh, underground. Uh, by the way, it's not going to blow up the Earth, despite some lawsuits in the state of Hawaii. Um, and so um, right now, uh, people have strong suspicions that there, there might be something interesting, but they haven't reached the energy that they should in order to get a really clean signal. So the, because of technical difficulties, the accelerator is not going to reach its maximum energy for uh, maybe two years. And so uh, we'll have to wait for that for definite proof of, uh, of dark matter. If that, it, that experiment last week had something to do yeah, with that. Yeah, it's the first step. Yeah, okay. that's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very exciting. But, you know, we tell people, uh, especially astronomy, uh, in the astronomy audience, that the answer to one of the biggest, biggest puzzles of, of the universe that we can observe with our telescope might come from an experiment underground in Geneva. They just look at you going, wow. Yeah. And then I go, wow. <laughs> uh, I think you were, yeah. Correct. <laughs> that's right. So that's a very good question. So we're not using uh, an equ equatorial mount. Uh, I wish we could because it would make things uh, simpler, okay, f because of the rotation of the field. So if you have an equatorial mount, the field, the telescope does not rotate with respect to the sky. When you have a, a altitude azimuth structure, the telescope rotates, uh, the sky rotates with respect to the telescope or vice versa, whichever one you want to look at it. So um, the reason why we don't have a, before I, I answer your question, we don't have an equatorial mount because it would be far too heavy to build and impossible to build technically. So the way we do it is the rotation is actually, so we, we take care of the, uh, you can see the cylinder plugged into this box. What we do is we make the cylinder rotate because that's where the instrument is. So it's, sorry, uh, you, you see there's a cylinder here, a cylinder there, and then each one of these cylinders is an instrument. And so what we do is we rotate the instrument at that level to take care of the field rotation rather than trying to move the, the whole telescope. The telescope is supposed to um, work uh, down to one degree from zenith. So it's supposed to handle quite a bit of field rotation. Uh, yes? Uh, regarding your uh, resolution, I was uh, very interested in what's like that that we don't have here in the Milky Way. You'll be able to see these oddball things around here, won't you? Absolutely. It's a very good question. We're going to be able to resolve distant galaxies out to the Virgo cluster. So Virgo cluster is about uh, 45 million light years. We're going to be able to resolve those galaxies into individual stars. Okay, so for the first time, we will have pictures of galaxies that look like individual stars, yeah. In fact, everything is going to move with TMT. Um, think a globular cluster like Messier 13 or whatever. We're going to be able to watch Messier 13 fly across the halo of the Milky Way. Or we're going to be able to watch the Andromeda galaxy spin. You're going to be able to see the disk of the Andromeda galaxy spin. It's going to take about 10 years, and then we can see the disk rotate. So somebody mentioned one, M101. Who mentioned one? Yeah, Messier 101. Uh, back in, many years ago, an astronomer called Van Menen tried to measure the rotation of M101, 
and he thought he had measured the, the, the rotation of the, of the stars. He didn't. They were just uh, measurement errors. But we're going to be able to do his measurement with TMT for the first time. Um, we're going to be able, another thing that's going to be really cool is um, if you take a, a field of stars, and then you have a, a foreground star passing in front of that, those background stars, we're going to be able to see the lensing, gravitational lensing of the, foreground, of the background stars by the foreground stars and measure the mass of the foreground star just by watching the, the background star sort of going mm -hmm. as, the, as the star goes uh, in front of it. So everything is going to move, and that's a bit of a problem. Like, when everything moves, how do you measure things? That's a big science question that we have. How many staff are you going to have up at that level, and how many at sea level? Do you have any ideas yet? Oh, we have de so the question is, how many staff are we going to have for the observatory? We have a detailed breakdown of all the tasks by everybody. We know exactly how many people we need. It's about 120 people. And, and what's the breakdown between the sea level and... So uh, uh, at night, we're going to be maintaining a fairly s small crew of perhaps 10 people at most, and, uh, hopefully less. And uh, we're going to try to actually operate the telescope remotely from partner countries. So we're going to try to have remote observing from all the different countries that are part of the observatory, like India and China and Canada and so on. And that's being done already, so it's not a big deal. Yeah. <coughs> The question is uh, the capital cost for the, for the observatory. Uh, that's another number that we know very well. Uh, we have uh, a detailed description of the cost of the observatory down to the meals that the construction workers will eat during the construction phase. And the, the, the facility uh, with the air bar is around a billion dollars right now. And that's our cap. Um, it's more expensive than previous telescopes, but when you look at the scale of uh, projects in other sciences, such as ocean science and particle physics, were actually on the low end. So astronomy, it's a new thing for astronomy, but it's been done before in other sciences. So. Is the money in, uh, secured? So the question is, is the money secured? It always comes down to that. <laughs> so uh, the project is kind of interesting um, because we have uh, a, a benefactor who is quite interested in astronomy. His name is Gordon Moore. I don't know if you've heard of Moore's Law yes. for computers. So Mr. Moore is one of the founders of Intel, and he has a profound love of astronomy. And he gave us $300 million to get started. And so we have uh, Mr. Moore's money to get started, and then we have all the other partners that are coming together to get the rest. So the idea of the partnership is that there's a smaller share across each partner, and uh, that's how you get these things built. All these things are built through multi-partner international collaboration. There's no other way of doing it. So, uh, and in fact, Mr. Moore intended at the beginning to fully fund the entire thing, but because of the uh, internet market bubble, he, his worth was not as much as he had hoped by the time we get on sky. <laughs> but you know, when somebody gives you $300 million, it's just, you know, it's, it's fantastic. And uh, yeah, he's, he really, really loves astronomy. And he lives in Hawaii as well. That's not, because, that's not the reason why we're putting the telescope there. He never, ever said, I want you to put it there so I can see it from my window. He never did. <laughs> but uh, he, you know, it, it is one of the best sites on the planet. And, uh, Does he get to peek through it? I sure hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't get his name on it. Uh, that's a good question, yeah. But uh, you know, look at the acronym carefully. <laughs> That's my own personal take on this, by the way. It's not an official project position. It's my personal take on it. But the acronym would work. You, you talked about, um, about advances in, in computer technology required to build this project. Are there other uh, technological uh, breakthroughs that you're going to need in order to accomplish this? Like, for instance, lubricants or... Okay, so the question is, uh, I mentioned we need a computer uh, breakthrough for uh, the telescope to work. And the question is, uh, are we going to need other breakthrough? I, th I would say that on many levels, this is sort of a conservative facility. Uh, it tries to use, for minimizing the cost, we try to minimize the new technology that we need it. So, uh, but it's, we, we um, I think in terms of control al algorithms is pretty much where a lot of the development will take place. Obviously, if you had better mirrors, better detector, you could build different instruments, and, but that's going to come in time. But the basic structure of the observatory, the 
the telescopes and the optics and that sort of stuff will last for 50 years and remain relevant for 50 years. There was a question at the back there. Just a number of years ago, there was a lot of concern by the, the uh, local indigenous peoples about the area and the use of the mountaintop. And uh, I understand there's negotiated that there could be rather severe restrictions on developments on the mountain. Yes. I'm just wondering, uh, that's a pretty sizable footprint for a facility. I was wondering what negotiations or what has gone on. Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. So the question is, how are we going to uh, get permission to build the telescope there? Uh, as you may know, Mauna Kea is a sacred place to the native Hawaiians. It's a beautiful place. If you've been there, you will understand why it's a sacred place. You, can, you feel it. And so extreme respect must be paid to that wonderful place. And uh, it's fair to say that in the past, there's been disrespect. I, I, I've seen it myself. And we're, not, we're trying to avoid the mistakes of the past by being, uh, instead of talking to um, third parties, we're going straight to the local communities. And so we had an extensive public consultation process where we went from village to village in Hawaii to listen to the people and what they had to say. And two things emerged from that. The first one was the way that we're going to compensate the local population for the, the permission to use their site is we're going to offer a scholarship program to the local kids. People, wanna, you know, people in Hawaii, like everybody else, want to know what their kids are going to be doing when they grow up. And the, most Hawaiian would say that a facility like this is a tremendous opportunity for their young ones. And so if we start now, by the time the uh, with the training program, by the time the telescope gets on sky, we will have local kids that can work at the telescope. The other thing that's changed is that there's now a, fr a legal framework to manage the permission process. So there's very um, well uh, described phases and steps to be taken to get and eventually a permit uh, to build on the mountain. And that's helped everybody understand what to expect and how to manage things properly. So, so far, things are going well, and um, there's good support for the, for the facility. And, uh, I, th and I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's, we, we, as a project, wanted to make sure that we did things differently than what was done in the past. It was very important. And I'm, I would not be working on a project that would desecrate a, uh, a place like Mauna Kea. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, uh, yes, you. Yeah, they're they're yeah they're they're all yeah they're all so there's eighty. So, so do they have to be all uh, finished or tested as a unit or use Ah, so yeah, how are you going to test the segments? So the, the the segments are going to be tested as units. Yes, yeah. But at the end, when they are put in the, in the telescope primary mirror cell, there's a special instrument that's going to look at all of them at the same time and phase them together. So we have a special instrument, and the the job of that instrument is to phase all the mirrors together to give you a single mirror. But there's a lot of lab testing that goes into each one because we know exactly the shape of each one down to uh, tw uh, 25 nanometers. Uh, you had a question? Just, yeah. Uh, yes. Are you thinking in the, into the future, like the Keck, are you thinking of perhaps twinning this someday? Twinning it? <laughs> <laughs> wow, you're speaking to my uh, wildest dreams. <laughs> Yeah. There's four of them, and, and there's two in the, in the keg. Right, you right. You get a, a larger baseline, you know. Ah, yeah. Have I, you ever thought of that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> that'd, be, yeah, that'd be really cool, but I think it'll be uh, hard uh, giving the, the cost of these things. Um, yeah, but if you wait, it's going to cost more. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the way you're thinking, really. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes, question? Yeah, what's going to have to shut down to keep uh, budgets in line? And I'm thinking, yeah. I'm hearing astronomers say yeah. that some observatories, current ones, are going to have to shut down. Yes, so the, the question is, what are we willing to give up to, uh, to uh, get access to a new facility? There are two, I think there are two aspects to that. There's two, there's two aspects to the answer. The first one is, it's clear that we're going to have to give up something that's unavoidable. Uh, and we have a plan to phase out some facilities that we currently have when something like TMT comes on. TMT is not the only one. There's another radio telescope called ALMA 
that's coming online as well. So we have what we're doing is we're phasing out our older facilities as the new ones come online. The other thing that we have to keep in mind is that this is not a zero-sum game. Um, if we are successful as a community, and I have to say that the Canadian astronomers on the world stage are doing extremely well, by some measures we're number one in the world in terms of science impact. So if we're successful, then success breeds success. And if you show people, um, so let me give you a personal story about this. When I started in grad school in 1990, I went to a meeting in Vancouver to discuss the future of Canadian astronomy. It was the most depressing meeting of my life. We were told at the time to quit astronomy now because there was no future. And if you took the people in that room in 1991 and showed them where we are today, they would never have believed it. So I think we have to adopt the same attitude of think big uh, to be successful. So, while keeping our feet, in uh, you know, in reality. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, what would be your first choice to look at? This comes online. Ooh. <laughs> what would be my first choice? I, uh, you know, I have to admit that uh, even though I don't work in that field, I would point it at some exoplanet. By the time that this thing comes online, we will have many candidates for Earth-like planets. Uh, give it another couple of years, and we'll know whether there are Earth-like planets around other stars, and I would like to train my telescope around one of those stars to see what we can see. But I don't work in that field, but I'm personally very excited. Everybody's excited about the exoplanets and the potential there. How and would, how would this be as a moon scope? <laughs> uh, I, I think it's fair to say it would be a pretty good moon scope if your detector survived the photon arrival rate. It's a lot easier to feather their orbiter now and they're getting really stunning images back. Chuck just sent me a photo. Yeah, it's the, but the moon is far too bright. Uh, you need a pretty big filter to uh, <laughs> take that out. Yeah, I'd, be, I'd be scared, actually. <laughs> But, uh, you know, at Jupiter, we're going to do as well as the space probes are there about, so that's not too shabby. Yeah. So even Mars is too close? No, Mars would work. Yeah, we can do stuff on Mars, no problem. Yeah. 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 Is this any infrared capacity? Uh, we are, we, can, we will be observing um, all the way from um, 300 nanometers, so the uh, blue side of the optical spectrum, all the way to 28 micron, which is uh, the mid-infrared wavelength. So the telescope can observe through that wavelength regime. Yeah, yeah. This is a little off topic where you touched on it. Oh. Uh, you mentioned back in the early 90s, it was very depressing. And uh, then, I guess, a number of years after that, they came up with a 10-year, decade plan. Yeah. And now they're going to start in the next decade. Do you think these decade plans actually get everybody on the same wavelength? And yes. And use yeah. and be so it's a, it's a, one of the reasons why I came back to Canada is because I thought that the consensus in the community was very nice to see and that it was going to go somewhere. And we did. The first long-range plan, which is a 10-year planning uh, process, was good in getting us things like TMT, ALMA, James Webb, and so on. And the next one, the report is supposed to come at the end of, the, of this year, and it's supposed to plan the next 10 years. And let, let me tell you, I've seen the list of things that went into the report, and the list of projects is absolutely spectacular. I mean, things you... That seems like science fiction, but it's it's real. Yeah. I know nothing about the. When you look at your image, you see at the top you have a fairly obvious notch in your mirror. Oh, the yes, the yeah. over here, yeah. The the edges are ragged because of the each segments, yeah. But it doesn't seem to be a consistent raggedness. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, so it's not a. Necessarily a, a smooth edge. No, it's it's arranged. So basically, um, when you calculate the the, uh, the diameter, okay, you uh, yeah, what, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> it's a very good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, well, that may actually be a glitch there. I think, but it's true that I mean. Uh, it's a circle down to the resolution of 1.4 meter because that's the size of I individual segments. So you try to make it as circular as you can, but it's not quite there. Yeah. Although I got to admit that that one there is kind of looking kind of weird. <laughs> Good eyes. Yeah. Yes. Can you name some of the companies uh, that 
Oh boy, um, <laughs> I'm, we made a list of all those companies. Um, well, yeah. Um, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> uh, the the uh, the the one for the dome and uh, the structure is uh, Dynamic Structure Limited in Vancouver, and then we have other companies working on uh, cooling systems and things like that. Um, and so what happens, the way we do business is we have a website, and on the website we publicize uh, the request for information, request for quotes, all that information is on our website. And in Canada we put it on uh, the NRC website, the National Research Council website. Uh, we have a, a branch uh, called IRAP, and we yeah. go through uh, them to publicize the uh, opportunities for, for things like that to get involved. And so basically the way it works is we put out these things on the websites and it's open to everybody, really. We yeah. You mentioned that the uh, power supply for the uh, telescope is a set of generators. At yes. The base. Yeah. Isn't that sort of against green? Yeah. So the the generators are backup generators. We're going to be running off the grid. Uh, we need a megawatt power, and um, we're going to be running off the grid. Uh, but if something goes wrong with the grid, like the power in Hawaii can can oh, be. So there is a utility that goes. Yes. Over the, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the generators are going to be used only in case of a uh, of a blackout or something like that. Sometimes it happens. Like sometimes the, the, island, the entire island is going to lose power. So if your dome is open and there's a blizzard coming, you want to be able to at least close the dome and put the telescope in a safe position. Well, blackouts are a good thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not if, uh, if your telescope is down. <laughs> yeah. uh, How about an earthquake? It, like, it just occurred yeah. to me with CFHT there was damage. Yeah. The thing actually bounced a bit. Yeah, so what about earthquakes? Uh, speaking by experience, I was on CFHT when one of the earthquake hits. It, it was uh, it was enough to break off the mount of a couple of telescopes. Um, TMT is built to withstand a thousand-year earthquake. So an earthquake that occurs every thousand years. So it's something like a 8.5 or 8.4. That's our that's our design requirement. So the thing is built to sustain uh, pretty uh, FT earthquakes. Yes? You mentioned uh, about a megawatt. That's a huge heat source. Is that why you're kind of relegated away from all your companies? Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're the black sheep of the gang. Um, actually, what, what we do is the, uh, the heat is going to be sent down a tunnel, and the tunnel is downwind from the facilities, all the facilities. So all the exhaust, the, the, the hot air from the generators will go out the back door in a way that will not disturb the image above our telescope and the other telescopes. Yeah. Uh, you know, the amount of uh, thinking that goes into these projects is absolutely insane. You know, sometimes you, people, you see people worrying about stuff that you never thought would be important, but it is. So uh, another uh, thing that we had to worry about is, um, so when you have, just to show you, so um, you see the mirror here, right? You see the instruments? Think of them as stone edge. So when the wind, the air flows above the primary mirror, it, the instrument create a, a wind shadow and turbulence above the mirror. So the lower you can make the instrument, the less uh, cross-section they offer to the wind and the less turbulence they produce above the primary mirror. And uh, so that sort of stuff we, we do, we have a, a person and that person's only job is to model the airflow above the entire telescope, the dome, and everything with uh, computational fluid dynamics. And it's all you know, done on, on supercomputers and that sort of stuff. And he can show you where the air is doing all the head eddies, where they are, and that sort of stuff. And that's why we have flaps and we have uh, all kinds of uh, features that try to minimize the, the disturbances of the airflow. I mean, yeah, that's what you need for telescopes nowadays. We're looking at vibrations. Uh, the size of the physical size of our images are just a few microns, right? And so, if something is jittering the instrument, that's it; it's game over. So we need to put in special systems to isolate them, and and uh, we take vibration control to a new, new height. That has nothing to do with the adaptive optics. Adaptive optics. Uh, 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 you need to control vibrations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Can you 
maybe have time for one more question if anybody. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Luke. That was uh, really exciting stuff. Now we're going to get into the, the fun part. We've got some uh, awards and some, some door prizes. And Luke, before you, before you go, Luke, I've got uh, something for you from the club here. It's a, uh, a little plaque with a, with a meteorite on it. No way, really? Yeah, wow. yeah, and your name. <laughs> yeah, it's from, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, Sikot Alin. Anybody? Anybody? Ron's not here. Wow. So, so it's a meteorite for you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you very Thank much. You. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Thanks, Thank you very much. So uh, we have here 2010 Paul Commission Observe of the Year Award. And I know we have Paul here tonight. No, Paul, did you want to? Yes, I will. So who's the recipient? Uh, yep, actually, Bill. Uh, yes. Would you like to come up? So here's the yes. award, and who's you want me to, okay, all right, and this year's Paul Commission Observer of the Year is? Congratulations. Well done, Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And our second award of the evening. I have to describe this one. Oh, this is the. Ah, okay. Uh, is this the. No, this is not that. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, so this is a, actually a, an unofficial award for. This year, I, it's the first year that we're doing this award. This is for a presentation of the year at our uh, center monthly center meetings. So I'm going to invite uh, Bill to come up to the, the podium again, and uh, we'll announce uh, our our winner, who is Simon Hanmer, yeah, yeah, yeah. Vallis Marineris. I haven't, haven't seen Simon here tonight, so uh, we'll, we can, we can uh, mention at the next uh, center meeting. We certainly will do so. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. All right. So this, this one does have a plaque. And this is... So this is... Uh, for Astronauts Article of the Year, and I'm going to invite our Astronauts Editor, uh, Deborah Cervolo, to come and present that. Whoops. Well, now, does anybody here have a camera? I need this for astronauts. <laughs> 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 now, this is a person that's very deserving of uh, the Article of the Year Award. It was actually two articles, and um, it's... Uh, <laughs> I wanted to encourage this person to uh, continue to write articles because uh, I'd like to see a lot more articles come in. And uh, not only that, but the work he's doing as well. And uh, everybody knows uh, Sanjeev has already been up here, so Sanjeev, come back up. 